Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. Got my bro, Luke Simons, like diamonds. What's up, dude? Uh, double like diamonds, man. That's uh, that's trouble. I, I was funny. I look in the comments, and uh, some people hate on it, and uh, other people other people say to keep doing it. So I'm indifferent. I don't know. I don't think there's any way you'll stop doing it. So why oh, definitely it? not. No, it's part of me. The thing's trademarked and got its own website and Instagram page, and none of that is true, by the way. Uh, what should have its own Instagram page is your haircut. If you guys are listening to this and not seeing it. I did that video yesterday with you and me and, and Deeks and um, dude, a lot of people, comments. yeah, a lot of people like this could be one of the best mullets in, in the fishing space. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, it's looking really good. Yep. But what's funny, I mean, you're catching more fish, or, you know, or we're getting more insiders. We just passed 15,000 new insiders. Like oh, our, our, our whole membership and the, the, the kind of people we're attracting, like, everything's been on fire since your hair's been growing so yeah uh, I, feel, I mean i feel like i'm even like running faster i mean it's wow. like there's a lot wow. of there's a lot of benefits that i really wasn't planning on so this it's is been, great news awesome. this, this covid hair has really really been paying off and and we're catching some monster fish too which ties in with this entire episode here and it's really about being at, at the right place at the right time and and we were fishing with with captain peter deeks and he's got this one area pretty dialed in. And so a lot of this, what we're going to talk about does take experience, but it's something that most people are just not even thinking about. And what was interesting, we're on his boat and he's pointing out, he's like, oh, these people are here. They're, they're here too, too early. Uh, they're over there. They're, they're too early. Like he, he knew exactly when that bite was going to happen. And a lot of people, if you ever fish like a dock at night, look, remember we used to do that as, as kids in Little Gasparilla Island, we'd fish those, those docks for snook. And remember, like you, you'd see them there, like you could literally see 80 snook underneath the light, right? And and it would be one thing it would be like, all of a sudden, one minute, they would be on you might only have a 20 minute window, maybe even less, when it was like, you could throw anything and they were destroying it. And then one second after it was like a clock hit, they weren't touching anything, you might you might get one here and there. And we saw the same thing yesterday. And he knew it like that one boat, there's that one guy next to us, he was sitting there the whole time. He was there for like an hour grinding it out and he leaves and Deeks is like, man, he's going to miss it. And all of a sudden you and I are like doubling up. Like it was like everything we threw in all of a sudden was getting hit. And he missed that entire episode because he, he, he barely missed that. Uh, you know, it was, it was partially tied, partially the amount of water that was coming in. It was coming in incoming. It was partially because the, the pressure change, but it was like everything happened at once. And it was like a feeding frenzy. Just it started. And this is in the middle of the day, by the way. And it, it was just like, boom. And it was so cool to see that. And it was so cool for someone like Deeks, who is on the water 300 days a year, like almost predicted like, hey, it's going to happen anytime now. And as soon as he said it, boom, we started getting tight lines. It was pretty cool. The key lesson is to pay attention to the details, um, especially if you want to go out and consistently catch good fish. So Peter Deeks does this to the extreme, and that's why he catches big fish more than most other people. And um, and I, I'm pretty like I I pay attention to the details, but I I I was uh, I was blown away by how much time he put into making sure that we were there and set up at the time that he knew it was going to be. Yes. And so in this case, this is an area that gets fished pretty hard. Um, there's a lot of other people gunning for that. For that. So there's like one spot in particular where all like the biggest snook had been hanging out and he knew where it was and he knew exactly when they're going to be there. And we don't just show up like 20 minutes beforehand. Like we were there like two hours beforehand. And it was so much to the extreme that the dock that we were targeting, they were literally doing construction on it. And so we sat there and they're like drilling, they're making all sorts of noise. They have like one of those little boats those boats, the little small barges that, you know, that, that hit down the pilings, that thing was like burning over right over the spot. And we sat there, we sat there and waited. He's like, oh, uh, we had to wait on this, this tide to change. He's like, he's like, they're going to be, they're going to be biting in probably about an hour and a half. So we we're just kind of, you know, just, just chatting and doing a little bit of fishing, but I'm not really expecting much. And sure enough, as soon as that tide did what he was expecting, even with that barge still there and then those guys were making all sorts of commotion, we started hooking up. Like it, and, I was blown away. And what's funny, and, and this is this is the big learning lesson. If you take away anything, it's this. So we sat in that spot for an hour and a half. Like he got us positioned perfectly. We were anchored perfectly. And you and I, like you said, we were kind of fishing. Like I was getting bored. 
And you remember, I even said to to Deeks, I was like, man, you surely don't want to let go try somewhere else. And that's what most anglers would have done. They were literally, you think about if you fished a spot for an hour and a half, we hadn't had a single bite and we were fishing like not a single bite. I had artificial lure, Luke had live bait, not a single bite. And we could see fish. Like we could see shadows. We knew there's some fish down there, not a single bite for an hour and a half. Most people would have left. We saw people leave. And because we stuck it out, because Deeks is like, no, it's about to happen. And all of a sudden it was just like a dinner bell rang. And all of a sudden we started getting tight lines and catching monster snook. I mean, it was crazy. And yet here I was, I was literally saying, you remember, I was like, man, Deeks, like, maybe we should just go try to catch some smaller ones somewhere else just to get some tight lines. I was like bored. Uh, but man, thank goodness you have someone who, who has it dialed in and who has a little bit of patience and, and a lot of it, you, like you said, it's paying attention. And I think even documenting, you know, when I spent that, I guess, five nights down at Placida and I used to go f- fish that, that little bridge right there near the condo with Shauna. And, and I had a dot and I could, I caught fish every single night and morning because that first time I did it, I started writing down. I was like, all right, they're literally, I, same thing. It was like, it was an instant, like it was at 702. They just started biting from 702 to like 735. I could, I could get a, I could almost feel like every cast, something would either thump it or I I get a a fish on and then it died. And so the next night, you know, you, you, you fast forward uh, an hour basically. And it was, I mean, it just kept, kept happening over and over again. It was just like, this was like the, the, the perfect period to get a strike. And most people miss that period and, or they ended up going to some other place. And that period is the time where they're traveling or trying to power pole somewhere else and they've literally missed their, their chance to, to get a, you know, to really get one of the best bites of the day. And let's talk to about why that happened, right? What, what caused those fish in your opinion to all of a sudden just be turned on? It was like dinner bell feeding time. Well, it was, it was based on the spot. So every spot is different uh, and, you know, different spots are better during different tidal phases, different current movements. And, and even, wait a minute, I even, thought fishing was easy. I thought there was just one answer. Yeah, yeah, I wish that was the case. If it was, everybody would be catching giant fish every trip. So, so really, every spot is different. It's spot dependent on when that is. And so I don't recommend somebody to sit in a spot and sit there and sit there and sit there and just hope that the fish will start. Like this is, this is what you do after you've been to a spot a bunch of times and, and you've seen the intricacies on exactly when the fish are biting and when they're not biting. So for most people, if you're in a spot for 10, 15 minutes and nothing's happening, pick up a move uh, and, and then wait on a good time, right? And then just take note of when it's good. Um, otherwise, you're going to be sitting, you could be sitting in dead zones for a long time. Um, so, so really, again, the, the key lesson is, is really just to pay, like when you get into a good bite, take, you know, take note of the details, write it down. Like I, I feel like I have a bad memory for most things, but like I, I have like, I remember like all, at least all the good fish I caught exactly what lure it was and what the water was doing. So I just, I just kind of do it in my mind or just from looking back at the insider reports, but, but just pay attention to the details and you'll see over time, you will, especially for spots that you fish a lot, um, you're going to see the, uh, trends on exactly when the, the best periods are, whether it's a time of day or a tide phase in general, it's gonna be a tide phase in a certain time of the, of the phase, whether it's coming in or it's going out, the beginning, middle or end, it's gonna be one of those, one of those quadrants. Um, and then when a storm pushes through, so yesterday the bite turned on exactly when Peter said, uh, this big storm was coming up and like lightning was starting to get closed. Like I was, I was like about ready to call it early. And uh, we, we about did, we picked up the anchor and then uh, kept eyeing the storm and sure enough, it like wasn't coming at us very quickly. So we, we fortunately went back again. That's when most of the action happened. And right when that storm was coming in, the pressure changed, the wind started picking up. It was pretty, it felt pretty gnarly out there. And the fish start just totally fired up every single time we threw in there, we were hooking up with the beast. Um, probably like it felt like it, front. it felt like it dropped like 10 degrees. Right. I mean, it was yeah, just, it was, it was a legit cold front. It was like the first cold front of the year that I felt like that. And, uh, and yeah, the wind was started cranking, you know, just like, just like before a front comes in, you can feel difference, uh, difference in, in the air temp, the wind's picking up. You can even like smell, like, like, even like smell the rain. It's like one of those situations. And for some reason in passes in particular, it seen in, in, in inlets, passes and inlets, um, that's when the bite like turns on. So I used to do that. I used to fish Sebastian in a lot at night and it was best when those cold fronts in the winter time are pushing through 
and uh, the weather's terrible. Like it's not fun conditions, but man, those fish are really fired up. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're not recommending to sit out there and wait for a, for a storm to come either. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you know, use your very, very best judgment on that, especially if there's lightning, get the heck out of there. Uh, a little rain, not, uh, not as worried about, but if it's lightning, uh, I'd bolt out of there. Get it? Pun intended. Oh, yeah. No, we get it. Yeah, usually when you have to say, do you get it? It's uh, probably not a very good one. Jack. Nah, that's but, debatable. Uh, that's debatable. It's just a tough crowd here. But yeah, the, the, I mean, they're really unique. Like the, the level of analysis that Peter has put into that spot was evident in the fact that we got there, right? We got there the time that he was, that we were planning on. Uh, what was not planned is that there'd be dock work on this dock, like literally putting into, they put in two pilings while we were sitting there, like 30 feet away. Like never would I ever think like that. We're, talk, actually... we're talking to the guys. The What's construction that? workers were that close. We're like, oh they, yeah, we can, were, the, yeah. yeah, we're listening like, to construction guys. Hey, do you so want like, a bite of our sandwich? Close. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, and they had one of those big old clang things, you know, when they actually, you know, hammer the pilings down. And I was like, oh my gosh, please don't tell me they're going to start beating it. So fortunately they didn't use that, but they were using one of those hoses where they get the hose down and they basically like pump out the sand and the piling goes down. And literally, so sand is coming up everywhere. They're gunning the boat, that little barge boat. And so the, the prop stir is the, the prop wash is going like literally right, like we're in it and it's going right over the spot. Peter's like, yeah, they're going to be right here. They're going to be right here as soon as the tide turns. And like, it was right where this guy's prop was just, just burning up. And so I was sitting there thinking, I was like, there's no way. <laughs> I was like, there's no way we're going to catch him today. Like, this is insane. And, uh, and sure enough, like exactly when Peter said they were going to be there, they were, we started getting hits. And, and again, it was just, it was just a, a testament to how effective putting time into a spot can be. Only do it for really good spots. Like a lot of wade fishing guys and pier fishermen, like they do it to the T because they're out there all the time. Yep. There's a small amount of, of real estate to fish. And so the way to get better than everybody else is to know exactly how that real estate fishes throughout the different tide swings and current periods. And uh, that's that those, those details are what makes the, what separates the people who are catching a ton of fish to those who aren't. Yep. And uh, it's as simple as that. It's just, they, they paid attention to the details, they put in their time and they truly learned how the fish behave for that particular spot. And if you're wondering how to keep track of this the best way, well, old school is, you know, a notepad. Uh, then again, you could spill coffee on it, water. Dog could chew it up. Otis could literally chew up any, any type of notepad, big or small. Otis chews them all. Um, so we recommend our Insider Club. You know, that's another reason we built that private community. It's, you know, every angler has their own essentially, you know, kind of ongoing, never-ending wall that's, you know, based on, on dates and based on where you were and you can document all that stuff. And it was because a lot of it's incoming or outgoing, right? And in that case, you know, Peter knew that incoming tide is bringing in that, that clean water. Right. That's, that's where he wanted. And it was also towards the end. Right. So let's we'll give a little tip on that. Cause he even said, Hey, the beginning will be okay. Right. Uh, and we got some bites right when that happened. And he's like, you know, in the middle, when it's like really moving, it's hard for us as fishermen, it's hard to keep our baits down. It's hard for the, the fish. I mean, in the day, they're still like us they are kind of lazy feeders. Like they don't want to have to work too hard. And then he's like, towards that tail end is when it's really going to fire up. And then it did. And for us, it was like that perfect storm. It was getting closer to the tail end of the incoming, and we had the storm pressure uh, dropping the barometric pressure. I mean, it was like, it was nuts, dude. Uh, I wanted to stay out there longer minus the nasty storm coming our way. Yeah. And, and again, this isn't something that, this isn't the type of stuff that we, that we really teach and focus on in the Insider Club. This is like just super niche spot specific. Every spot is different. It really depends on how the water goes around, whatever structure you're fishing um, and the seasonality. Like in this case, it was, we were targeting big snook. So big snook are in this area for like two weeks. Like it's like a very short time of the year. And this is a, as, this is like a very unique situation that it really only applies to that one specific zone. And uh, so that's unlike the things we typically teach, which is the macro, right? Where, where how does the, the overall redfish, you know, behavior, like what, what will their preferences and tendencies, like what, what areas will they be in whatever bay you're fishing? And then what, you know, what are the, the most common things that really apply across the board 
um, based on how redfish react to changing water temperatures, to changing seasons, to current, right, into wind exposure, um, those sorts of things, because that applies across the board. That's like the more, the more macro stuff. Um, the minute level of details where fishing is a particular spot um, where you have to like hammer down the, the nits and grits, that's more for if you're going to go to a, a specific spot over and over and over and over again to, uh, to really get it dialed in. Yep. So what do you think about this? I, I've seen quite a few posts, you know, both in our Facebook group and in our, our private insider club where a, a somewhat newer angler is, has basically done the hardest part, which is find the three B's. And if you don't know the three B's, we preach them all the time. You know, it's finding birds and that could be, you know, birds that are sitting, diving, just any kind of bird activity usually means they're feeding on bait and then bait and then some boils, which means, you know, some type of predator fish that is stirring up some mud, silt, whatever it is. You, you have, it could even be a tailing redfish, but you're, you're seeing signs of all that. And I've seen some posts recently where a newer angler finds all three of them, which is really tough to do, right? Like that, that should be a feeding zone, but they fish it for a while. Like, oh, it wouldn't hit anything. I threw everything in my tackle box and this place stinks. And, and I, I disagree with that. And I, I'm guessing you probably do like that. That should be a good spot. They just might've missed that window. Right. And I agree with you that you probably shouldn't sit there an hour and a half but I would keep going back to an area like that as much as I could during that day or two to find out what that time is. Cause once you get that time, I mean, it's game changing now. Like you, you, once again, you take note of it and that's how you slowly dial in an area. Uh, what I hate seeing is, you know, like this one gentleman, he had said, man, I found everything. There's literally tailing redfish. I'm, there's birds diving and it wouldn't hit anything. And then he, he leaves and goes and fishes a bunch of crappy areas and doesn't see any more activity the whole day. Like I, you would have better off staying in that one spot and just keep fishing or back up for a little while, give them a break. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. I mean, most times when somebody gets to a good spot, right, where there's feeding activity, whether it's birds feeding or, and or the actual predator fish feeding and they're not catching anything, it's almost always due to a bad approach where they came in the wrong way or came in from the wrong direction so that you're not presenting your baits properly or you just flat out spook the fish you're stomping on the boat, right? Those, those fish, I mean, they're not stupid, right? Even if they're feeding, they're, you know, they're always alert for danger. And, and so in most cases, it's pull away, let them settle down, and then come back like 15, 20 minutes later. Um, so or it's rarely um, a lure problem. A lot of people are saying, I've, I've tried every lure in my tackle box. They, what probably happened is that they sat in the wrong spot, either too close or the wrong direction from the fish, and they were just throwing the, you know, a lure that probably would have worked otherwise, they were just doing it in the wrong way. And they kept doing it over and over again in the wrong way and that continued the same bad results. Um, so in, in most situations, if there's actual feeding activity and you just have a decent lure that somewhat mimics whatever the fish are feeding on, like in particular like redfish, sea trout and snook and flounder too, I mean, they're all pretty aggressive fish. Like if they're actually feeding, and you have a lure that even is close to what they're looking for, they will typically hit. So if they're not hitting, that's, that's usually something wrong with the angler. Um, I know because that, that's been me for many years and I'm just, just delivering the hard truth because once you do set up properly, and I did this in that uh, uh, insider report that I did with dad uh, back, it was, I guess, a year ago. Um, we got onto some fish. So we were in one spot, we weren't catching anything. We didn't change lures, right? It was, it, that we did, weren't seeing the three Bs. So instead of changing out of your lure and trying to make something happen in a bad spot, we just went off to a new spot, exploring some new areas. And then we got into some good redfish. And uh, like literally it was like, it was, it was really good feed. And so we started catching them. And then I was just, was, after a while, I was like, yeah, let me just like test out some different lures. So I had a white jerk bait that I started with. Then I changed to a smaller dark one. Then I changed to a bigger black one, right? I was like, a, the second one was um, root beer and yellow tail. Then I did a big black, like a one that was six inches. They hit that, they, they were hitting everything. I, I did a, a white top water, they hit it. I did a bullfrog, a brown bullfrog lure that's for bass fishing, they hit that. And long story short, they were hitting whatever we threw in there because they were, it was a good feeding zone. And when you find those feeding zones, it doesn't really matter what lure you have. Um, so as anglers, it's really on us to always make sure that we're in a good feeding zone, because once we do that, everything else is easier. 
And, uh, and so that's really that been the, the, the biggest game changer for, uh, for me over the years. Uh, trial. Because remember, remember, we always go to those spots that Dennis showed us um, when we we caught our first slam, and we were like high five, and like, oh my gosh, we finally got a slam spot. And we went back there over and over and over again. And no matter how many times we went, we were trying to analyze those details, but it just simply like wasn't it wasn't a good spot that we could like really niche down to like do what Peter did. Yeah. Um, because that's rare. Like that's very rare to to have a spot like that where it's like truly clockwork day in and day out in many cases it'll be one day and then next day and next day you'll have like a three or four day window maybe a week but it's very rare that it's like a an, you know all year long thing and so I, I i recommend to not sit and wait for two hours like we did unless you have like really spent time there and you know okay they're gonna they're gonna turn on this at this period yeah i mean if you can see like 40 snuck underneath your boat and you know they're in that spot then it could be worth waiting a little bit to the till it turn which is what we could see i mean we could literally see the fish down there uh that's a little bit different i think one of the the best pieces of advice and, and this is something you do i think more naturally now is is once you find a type of area that's working like we had a gentleman in the community that um that had made a report and he 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 had an area picked out he he watched the spot dissections that we do for our insider members he went to that area and, and he, right off the bat, he fished a point because we had talked about fishing some points that had, you know, some water moving around, some good current moving around it and caught a flounder. And instead of like, not only just sticking there, but trying to recreate that, he starts going off and doing other stuff. He's like, man, I wish I'd just stick to the points. The only two fish I caught in the entire six hours of fishing were points, right? That had moving water. And what I see you do is once you, once you have that same aha moment, you don't go keep trying random spots. You go try to recreate every point with moving water you can, right? You skip all the other crap and you're like, all right, hey, there's another little spoil island that has a point with current. Let's go hit that. And, and, that, and that's, you know, that's a trend, right? That's based on trends. And I think so many anglers, including me forever, like, you know, you get that one good bite and you're like, oh, I'm just going to keep fishing all around here. And then afterwards, you're like, man, the only fish I caught were in that one spot. Why don't I just go try to recreate that over and over again? Yeah, because we, we all we all do it. And, and I still do. I mean, the, I think the one, the biggest mistake that we all make, myself included, I still make it even though I preach all the time that you shouldn't do this is that we have, we have our spots, whether it's a half dozen spots or a dozen spots or 30 spots that, that we've caught fish on, right? So we've caught fish there, so there are confident spots. And we, we get on a trend, like what Joe mentioned, our first spot of the day, we find, we find that the, the fish are positioning, say on the deep side of a dock and we get them. And then we have a decision, okay, like, you know, bike slow down, do we go find a similar spot like that with docks in the same depth of water with the same amount of current flow and, 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 uh, and current and wind exposure? Or do we go to this spot over here that, I, that I've, I fished great last year that has mangroves and it's all shallow, like totally different type of spot? Yep. Um, the answer is go find some more docks that have a similar situation because that is gonna have a much higher chance of having success because you literally just proved it a second ago. Recency is so much more important than like a long-term trend. Yes. Like, like in this case, I mean, Peter, I don't know. I can't remember. I think he goes down like two or three days a week. So he goes down there a lot. Plus he's in contact with the guides down there. And so like they have a dial in. Like they're either he's there or one of his friends is there almost every day. So like they know exactly what's happening. Um, for like weekend warriors, you just can't do that. Right. And, and so it's really about having a network and, and or getting out on the, on the water as much as possible. Clearly the network is easier. That was my biggest, that was definitely my biggest um, impact when uh, I, was, I started fishing tournaments and just befriended a, a couple of other teams. Like we were all the, the corporate guys who had full-time jobs and couldn't fish all the time. And we were having to go against full-time guides and it's really hard to do that, right? So you have to, to really combine, uh, I guess, human intelligence and what's way more important than anything is what happened yesterday or what happened the day before yesterday than what happened like the past 30 years at this spot. Like I could, you know, every year is so different and just having the, the recency stuff is huge. Even what happened last week, I'll take what happened last week than what happened the past three years. Yep. Um, Cause it's, it's just fish move around so much and uh, just having some recent info on the, on the type of spot that the fish are holding based on the conditions um, that is invaluable. Which is 
big part of our insider club. You yeah, guys have to join. Do. Yeah, come join us. Exactly right. And that's why we do We'd the weekly game plan. Yeah, the weekly game plan we do every Friday just just highlights the most recent trend so that if, it, if people don't have time, it does it under 10 minutes. So anybody who doesn't have time, which is most people, to go through all the content that comes out every week, it's just, hey, here's what you need to focus on. Here's the trends that's been happening. Here's what to look for. Here's how to find those spots. And then here's the lures to use in those spots. And it yeah. just makes it all easier. Yeah, I had a, oh, go for it. Go for it. I had a young man, uh, I believe it was, yeah, it was via Instagram, a direct message. And, you know, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling to catch redfish in uh, my area. He showed me the area and I, I gave him some tips. He's like, all right, I'm, I'm joining. He's like, you know, do you guys have a ton of spots for me? And, and I, I said, actually, we, we don't. And I was like, well, we don't sell spots. And, and I said, you want to know why? I was like, because spots are worthless, right? When you consider that fish move every single day, every single tide cycle, I was like, what's more important and what we offer are trends. And we actually get on a map every single Friday and 10 minutes or less and show you what types of spots to fish in your area based on trends, based on all the intel that we're gathering from our entire community, based on our on the water trips every week. And, and it works. I mean, we get testimonials daily of people that are saying, man, I, you guys changed everything for me just in the 10 minute video, not, not even to mention the, the discounts on tackle and, and all the other how-to tips and comparisons and rod and reel reviews, et cetera, that we do for insider club. And uh, I mean, and as soon as you hear that, it's like, oh, okay, I'm in, I, I get it. Uh, Cause that's powerful, right? Because we all know we've all bought those top spot maps and so not to pick on them, but you know, just any of those little spot maps in general, I think they're helpful because it gives you an idea of, of where fish could be. Uh, but then again, it's not that helpful because you get reliant on a GPS spot and then you get there and you realize, oh man, this thing stinks. Like this doesn't even look like this anymore. Or like, and I, you know, it's, it's land because it's low, it's crazy low tide versus when you go off a trend on what's working right now, you know, putting you in that, that 90, 10 zone, you know, where, where we always talk about that 90% of the feeding fish are in 10% of an area because of trends because of the stuff that this whole podcast is talking about, because of the, the small little notes that guys like Luke and guys like other fishing coaches are, are taking every week on, all right, putting this whole puzzle together, right? All right, these fish have all been in this depth. These fish have all been feeding on this type of bait fish, uh, anywhere from Texas to Florida to the Carolinas. And, and it, is sh it, it shifts a little bit. It's a little bit different. But then again, it's all very, very much the same. And these yeah. all fish are wired the same. They all have the same biology, the same makeup. They all have the same wants and needs, just like humans, regardless of where we live. We all kind of have the same wants and needs as, as people. Fish are the, the same way. They're, they're looking for bait. They're looking for shelter. They're trying not to get killed. And uh, when you kind of th throw all that together, you're like, all right, well, where would they be in this scenario? And it, it makes it a whole lot easier, which is what we promise is, is an insider member is to save you time and then save you money. So if you haven't joined us, come join us. Saltstrong.com. Inside a club, baby, fifteen thousand plus now. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, just hit the fifteen thousand. Yeah, and, and what what has surprised me um, really since starting Salt Strong is uh, you know started dialing in the trends for every species is different, right? Redfish, snook trout, flounder, they're all they're all different. They all have their nuances, but they're way more consistent across regions than I ever thought. Like I I used to fish. I grew up fishing Boca Grande and Tampa. Then I moved to Melbourne and fishing the Indian River and this. I was surprised at how similar the fisheries were. And I was like, hey, maybe it's just a Florida thing. And, uh, and so we did the inshore slammer course. That was the very first course that we, uh, that we did was uh, once we started Salt Strong. And I remember, you know, people, people in Florida were having, you know, going in and, and had some good testimonials. So we're like, you know, this is, this is cool. It's working in, in the panhandle. It's working further south. And I remember that some Texas people started getting into it. So I was like, oh man, like I was worried there's gonna be some bad reviews coming in. And sure enough, those same trends, right, the, the same trends that were taught and still are taught in that course and what we highlight every week in the Insider Club that are, that are species specific, that are behavioral um, based on, you know, on how a redfish or snook or tarpon or, or, or snook reacts to um, the changing conditions, the same exact reactions occur to redfish in Florida as they do in Texas, as they do in the Carolinas and everywhere in between. Um, so that was, that was the really cool thing that, that really blew my mind, I should say, um, since just networking with, with people throughout the community, you know, throughout the Insider Club. Yep. I love it. We know hope, you guys, all the board. hope you guys join us. And what, a, what, a, what the other thing that blew my mind recently is this underwater bait forensics course. Holy smokes. 
thing is sick. It's like a hundred videos and they're all, you know, short of just showing how every single type of bait really looks underwater. And, um, you know, Peter, I, I love how he says it. He's like, man, so many people, they just, they get on my boat. I see him on other captain's boats. I see him out there as weekend warriors. And they think just because they got lively bait, you know, they can catch a dozen, like our boy Lunker Dog says, that they're just going to go out there and catch fish that just because they got live bait that everything wants to eat. And he's like, that is so not true. He, he's like, so many people miss so many opportunities because they rig it wrong. The same with a saw plastic, right? You could, you could be in the perfect spot with the perfect lure, the right color and everything, slam shady. And if you rig it wrong and it's helicopter in and you don't know what it looks like underwater, you don't have a chance. And he's like, it happens time and time and time again. He's like, it happens to me sometimes. They get sloppy, you get really excited. And he's like, even, even just the, the wrong hook size, the wrong weight, even just hooking it centimeters away from the right place even the wrong side can affect. I mean, it was, it's pretty mind boggling. So if you guys haven't checked that out, check that out as well. All at saltstrong.com forward slash products. You can join us in the club there. Check out all of the master courses, including the inshore slammer that Luke talked about. That's, uh, that, that's really the, um, I, I think that's our longest lasting one, right? And it's probably yeah. the most purchased one because that was the first one. And then Redfish was after that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good. And the, the Bay Forensics is, is really, it really is awesome. It's unique yeah. in the fact that it, it actually shows the different baits underwater, uh, rigged different ways to show the good and the bad, like what happens when it's rigged properly. Yep. And then what it looks like when it's not rigged properly. And it's a game changer. Obviously, for smaller fish that are, um, let's just say a little bit dumber fish, you know, a, a, even a, a poorly rigged uh, bait can still can still work. But if you're going after like the, the big like trophies, like like what Peter specializes in, paying attention to these details is extremely important. Yep. Um, and and it's, it's surprising how, as Joe mentioned, just rigging it um, just slightly different, it can totally can totally either wreck or totally make the uh, the bait as far as getting getting the, the trophies to eat. So, yep. Cool. Well, check that out. It's saltstrong.com forward slash products. At saltstrong.com forward slash products. And otherwise, we'll see you guys on the next episode. We are out. Peace. Let's go hit the water, do some fishing when the storm passes. Jeez. Yeah, this has been a lot of a lot of afternoon thunderstorms. Stay oh, safe yeah. out there for the lightning. If you're, if everybody going out in the afternoon, especially, it's been yeah. it's been crazy over here. No doubt. All right, we out, guys. Thank you. We appreciate you. Peace. See you.